The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. We're excited today to have Ishan Tizani, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Bodo, uh, a new parallel computing platform that supports Python and SQL, which he's going to talk about today. Um, prior to starting Bodo, he was a researcher with Intel Labs, but actually was sitting on site here on, at Carnegie Mellon as part of a collaboration with Intel and CMU. Um, and then prior, before that, he, he did his PhD at UIUSD. And prior before that, he got his uh, undergrad degree in computer engineering at the best school in Iran, which is Sharif University. So with that, Ishan, the, the floor is yours. Again, for everyone else in the audience, if you have any questions for Ishan as, he, as he's giving the talk, unmute yourself, say who you are, and ask your question. And feel free to do this anytime. Please interrupt him. That way he's not talking to himself for an hour. Okay? All right. Thanks so much for being here, man. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, everyone, for taking the, the time. Excited to be here. Uh, uh, and thanks for the kind introduction, if I can change the slide. So just a little bit about the story of how Bodo and this, uh, this work came, came about. Um, I got, as Andy said, I got my PhD from UIUC, which is source of, uh, sort of the hub for HPC. Um, I was working on parallel programming systems, energy efficiency of supercomputers, uh, working with national labs on kind of uh, uh, supercomputers, everything is good. But the codes we were working on were MPI, Fortran, C++, very low-level codes that are not accessible to anyone other than the experts at, at national labs. So everyone, kind of any science domain data scientists we saw uh, were writing uh, Python, MATLAB, these kind of codes. So I joined Intel Labs and uh, uh, for some portion I was at CMU to work on the marketizing HPC and compute for data analytics and uh, average kind of everyday developer. So we built various things in Julia and Python. Uh, after four years of research, uh, uh, when it was clearly successful and works on real applications, uh, uh, started Bodo in uh, mid 2019, uh, building a parallel computing platform for data analytics which supports Python and SQL, which has a very interesting story of why SQL, <laughs> which I will discuss in a little bit. So general outline of the talk, a little bit of background and motivation for what we do, how we solve the problem, the Bodo approach, uh, what is Bodo SQL and how does it work internally using Bodo, a little bit about optimizations, a little bit about resiliency. There's a lot of misconceptions, I would like to discuss and uh, conclusion of the talk. So let's get going. Uh, at a high level, there's a lot of data in the world and all organizations, small and big have some sort of data and they would like to take advantage of it to solve new problems, improve efficiency, competitive advantage, so on and so forth. And therefore they are hiring a lot of data scientists. However, um, according to Gartner, 86% of data science projects fail and don't go to production. From our point of view, the challenge is that the applications that data scientists develop on their laptops on small data don't scale to production easily. And uh, there are a lot of barriers to production from that prototype. So uh, we think data is really a programming problem. How can we enable data scientists and data engineers to write code that works on large data? and uh, uh, scales seamlessly. So that's what we are focused on. In terms of the languages, Python is really dominant today and is the language of data science because Python allows data scientists with domain expertise. They are not necessarily uh, software engineers. They don't have a lot of them CS degrees. They know programming through maybe sometimes an online course or, on or online material. So they are not really focused on the writing code aspect of it, but Python allows them to write complex code quickly. And uh, this, is, this data is from Stack Overflow, the number of uh, questions, uh, the portion of questions per month in the past couple of years. And Python is by far uh, the most dominant and you can compare to R and SQL and Spark, you will see that Python is pretty popular. 15% of all Stack Overflow questions are in Python. Python is used 
uh, not only for data and machine learning and things like that, for other things as well, but the main use case these days is data applications. So at, uh, at a high level, the problem goes back to the simplicity performance gap problem in computer, computer science. The fact that um, uh, high level scripting codes like Python, MATLAB, Julia are easy to write, but they are uh, uh, slow and not scalable run as, on a single core, typically on some uh, interpreter, not even machine code. But on the other hand, HPC codes are low level, MPI, Fortran, C++, they are fast and scalable, hundreds of thousands of cores, but they are very complicated and very few people in the world can uh, write those codes and get them to work. So there is a huge simplicity performance gap that a lot of CS researchers have worked on for several decades. Um, the challenge is to come up with a programming mm -hmm. system that provides uh, simplicity, performance, and generality at the same time. For today, uh, you have to pick two. You can't have all three at the same time. For example, the Python uh, data libraries of pandas and NumPy, they are pretty general for data problems. You can solve a lot of problems um, in them, different domains. They are very simple, but they are not fast. They're single core and not scalable. On the other hand, uh, writing low-level MPI, C++, code, by the way, MPI stands for message passing interface, uh, uh, dominantly used for uh, writing uh, parallel programs in the HPC domain. So MPI is, MPI C++ is very fast, scalable, and very general, but it's not simple. So these are the two that uh, you get with this approach. Um, the other approach is building domain-specific languages like Halide. Halide is uh, uh, a domain-specific language, DSL, for writing image processing pipelines. It's very fast, it's simple to use, but it's not general. It's a very rigid structure that allows the programmer to use and it's only focused on uh, image processing pipeline. So the holy grail solution is to have uh, a compiler that provides automatic parallelization for general data problems. And this is uh, what uh, uh, we have achieved at Bodo, we believe. Um, so before Bodo to scale data problems, uh, the main approach uh, uh, was the so-called big data framework approach, things like MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark. So the idea is that we create a library with MapReduce APIs that uh, uh, is implemented as a distributed system backend. And uh, the structure is there's a driver, it's like a single process, and there are some executors the driver runs the program. The program is sequential because the language is sequential. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, throughout the execution, the driver ex extracts tasks, schedule those tasks uh, to the executors, and they return the results. So this approach um, gained a lot of traction because it's much simpler than writing HPC code. HPC code is uh, not practical in practice uh, in any kind of commercial setting other than uh, some of the scientific applications and supercomputing centers. Because uh, the, developing those codes take a long time and a lot of, need a lot of expertise. So not as complicated, but still very complicated, not comparable to simple Python code. Also, uh, it, these frameworks are much slower than HPC and not really as a scalable, just on Google search Spark versus MPI, you will see so many examples of papers and things like that around uh, showing the um, massive performance gap of uh, Spark and MPI, for example. So um, from um, uh, the approach point of view, we believe that the distributed system approach is not a good fit for parallel computing. Uh, the reason is that when you are building a distributed system, let's say an internet portal client server um, application, uh, that the underlying assumption is that we have heterogeneous components, hardware, software, that are connected with some unreliable network that are far away. Uh, but this assumption is wrong for parallel computing because uh, the components, hardware and software are uh, homogeneous, the same CPUs in a cluster, same kind of compute running at the same time, both synchronous uh, algorithm and the network is fast and reliable. So a lot of assumptions are wrong. And uh, 
later in the talk, I will get back to this and show performance results and discuss this a little bit uh, further, why the distributed systems approach is wrong. Uh, but uh, first, uh, the most important aspect is uh, sim having simple code and programmability. Uh, because uh, programming, programmability for this area comes first, then performance. Uh, so in this big data approach, the front end today is mostly SQL or SQL-like things. Um, in Spark, the MapReduce APIs and some of the other APIs uh, are either very similar to SQL at a high level or um, they run on the same SQL engine. Um, and the problem with that is compared to the Python code, uh, the Python code is um, a very simple, expressive, imperative code and easy to express these data transformations. But if you write it in PySpark, you are essentially assembling a compiler intermediate representation IR for it that runs on the SQL backend. And all the constructs are lazy evaluation wrappers. The data frame is not really a Python data frame. You have to manage data partitions so um, it's pretty low level kind of code. Uh, so that's one option, the PySpark API that has these problems. Uh, a lot of um, programmers are forced to use SQL uh, for uh, a lot of these data applications. SQL is good for queries and a lot of things, but not everything. So if the application is complex and um, has complicated kind of uh, patterns in it, uh, the SQL queries become very long. These are de declarative and it's hard to understand and maintain the code and develop the code further. So we believe Python is better for a lot of data processing kind of big data applications as well over SQL. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can discuss it. But uh, the ideal solution we think is Python and SQL that uh, we have built and uh, I, will, I will discuss in a bit. So here is an example of uh, Bodo code and how, how Bodo works. Uh, the code is in standard Python pandas, um, you know, standard APIs, read parquet, you can load terabytes of data, um, you know, kind of these data frame, table operations, these mathematical operations are available. The programmer adds this Bodo.jit decorator to the function, and the workflow is just Python uh, from that point of view. But uh, the compiler replaces the function with an optimized and parallelized uh, version of the function as if an HPC expert wrote the code, except that it happens automatically and transparently. This uh, a use case is actually something real. It's very simple, but used in practice in the financial domain. And uh, you know they were able to run it on their kind of a small cluster, get over 100x speed up, much faster that, than Spark alternative. Also, uh, this described function provides a lot of information mean standard deviation, quantile, so on and so forth. Uh, but the Spark version of it uh, cannot do things like quantile because quantile parallel algorithm for quantile doesn't fit map reduce, uh, map reduce pattern very well. So they don't provide it. So uh, it's important to uh, have a proper parallel architecture to be more general than things like map reduce libraries. Um, so based on that, we believe uh, we have closed the simplicity performance gap for data applications. The development uh, simplicity is similar to Python uh, because it's a Python APIs, uh, but performance is uh, close to MPI. Things like Spark are somewhere in the middle. And uh, uh, we think uh, Bodo is a step function kind of improvement over previous approaches. Uh, so let's see how it, it actually works. It's a little bit of compiler stuff uh, that I will go through, uh, but uh, I'll try to get to Bodo SQL, <laughs> the things that probably this crowd is more interested in quickly. Uh, do you have any questions, Andy? I, I was just gonna say, I'm interested in compiler stuff too, right? Like compilers, we use compilers in databases, so yes, go for it. Okay, sounds good. Um, great. So. Um, Bodo is a different kind of compiler, and we uh, use this term inferential compiler because it, it infers a lot of uh, program properties. In a regular compiler, let's say GCC, the uh, high-level code, uh, the program code in C, something human readable, is translated to machine binary. There are some optimizations 
um, and register allocation, a lot of things that are done, but the program structure is the same. It's not fully parallelized. It's just sequential. Uh, and today you have to manually parallelize your code uh, in, in C. But with Bodo, uh, it understands the program structure and it's able to optimize it at a high level. So not like a scalar operations of kind of a, a addition of two integers and things like that being optimizing those. It's about join and group by and the kind of SQL level understanding of the program in Python uh, that Bodo is able to optimize and it's able to parallelize it and generate a fully parallel binary. So it's a very different kind of compiler and uh, I'll discuss why. Um, previously, uh, automatic parallelization has been explored uh, for a long time, um, for, for decades, um, and it, it failed because it's not used in practice today. Uh, the reason is they were trying to analyze loops and memory access patterns of loops in C or Fortran uh, programs. And um, one example is uh, the kind of transformation on the right I have, it's Fortran code, uh, it's array privatization transformation, meaning that this, there are temporary data structures in, in loops. When you want to parallelize some loop, it's better to, uh, for each processor to have a copy of those, those data structures. You don't want to go across processors and exchange data for those little things. Uh, it will uh, kill performance. So this work array, this parenthesis is actually array access in Fortran, um, uh, equivalent of brackets in CN, Python. Uh, mm -hmm. So this work uh, array is being privatized and uh, copied on a different processor. So that's one, one uh, transformation. So basically the previous approaches uh, would create a big uh, decision search space and use things like integer programming to make decisions and would come up with some approximate solution, which um, didn't really work in practice. In our case, it's actually harder in some aspects because we are working on Python and Python doesn't have static data types, it's dynamic typing, <laughs> and it has more complicated data structures than just arrays because we have things like data frames in, in Python, which are actually the main targets. So the way we are solving this problem is that we don't focus on loops. We focus on high-level APIs, and the way programs are written today is in terms of high-level APIs of pandas and NumPy and things like that. So that's where we focus. And um, we treat these high-level APIs as deeply embedded DSLs in the general program. So they are not just function calls, they are native operators of the compiler that are optimized and transformed along the way in the whole pipeline of the compiler. And uh, these APIs have uh, parallelization semantics that um, uh, the compiler exploits and is able to parallelize the program. So there is no loop uh, uh, kind of memory access analysis as such, or these kind of loop transformations necessary, which makes the problem uh, uh, something completely different and uh, manageable to solve. So uh, the way this compiler pipeline works is uh, the Python function is in bytecode in Python as a stack-based representation. Um, we transform it to an IR, which is done in, Py in Namba, which is an open source package. Um, and uh, then uh, we uh, transform these sort of DSLs in the compiler, you know, some transformations for data frames to convert them to some representation we like to, uh, the compiler understands and can optimize, transform the series operator, series or columns or these data frames in Python, transform them to arrays um, as much as possible, then we have this parallel accelerator uh, uh, component that is able to understand and uh, uh, optimize and uh, uh, take care of arrays. So we do the array transformation. At this point, the program is in a structure that's uh, in terms of the operators that, the, that we understand is fully optimized, ready for parallelization. So there is distributed analysis of how to lay out the, the, the data structures and computations. Um, and once that's done, it's transformed to a parallel version, kind of adjust allocations and loops and uh, insert the MPI calls for parallelization, stuff like that. And at the end, there is the 
uh, code generation uh, with MPI. Uh, MPI calls, which is uh, just a binary as if you wrote the code in C. So this is the compiler pipeline. Uh, we have a paper if you are interested in more, uh, some more details, uh, you can look at it. But the key piece of it, is there a question? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so maybe as actually the next slide. So like the, the basic idea is you have, you're assuming this Python function that you're gonna, you're gonna optimize and compile. It's, it's primarily making calls to pandas or, or NumPy. Um, and that you can pull out, you treat it as a DSL. I understand how that all works. Uh, but like, what if there's arbitrary Python in it that like takes the out, like there's like, take there's two Python calls, you take the output of one, sorry, two pandas calls, you take the output of one and feed it, like make some decision about the next. You can parallelize the first one and then you have to coalesce the result to a single one and you parallelize it again. Like you're handing all those like, data flow problems or you assume that the function only contains, you know, pandas numpy calls. Uh, so there is data flow in the program uh, we don't have, uh, I understand where this is coming from because in SQL, there is no, it's like a tree, it's easier to analyze it. But for us, we uh, we have loops and uh, conditionals and things like that too. Uh, yeah. So there, there is no restriction um, on that uh, side. In terms of APIs, the package APIs used uh, should be the things that the compiler understands, pandas, numpy, and we have a list of things, which are common things that are used for data, data programs. So I could learn, and some others, uh, but also uh, you can kind of write other JIT code and uh, mix and match uh, JIT and regular Python based on certain structure. So it's, it's quite general. Um, it's not super magic, like stick the decorator and forget about it and it will run. <laughs> um, you'll hit some issues, but uh, with a little bit of understanding of what's happening, uh, maybe uh, our goal is with half an hour of training, any developer should be able to pick it up and write their code. Okay, so the, the decorator example was the toy example. You're saying like, but a lot of times people come along with their, you know, their, their rando Python function, they add the, the Bodo decorator. It, 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 like, it doesn't always work because there might be some constructs in there that you're, you don't support. Yes. Okay, yes. that's right. Okay. Uh, and I actually have a slide on this a little bit okay. later on the limitations. All right, awesome, keep going. All right, uh, so the parallel, uh, uh, the automatic parallelization piece is the uh, main secret sauce. And as I mentioned, it's about exploiting the parallel semantics of these pandas, numpy, and other operators, which are implicitly parallel because they work on arrays. And we also know that for these applications, the parallel patterns are map reduced, not to be confused with the map reduce system, just the parallel pattern and relational operators join and group by and things like that. So we know the parallel, parallel patterns and uh, we know that a lot of the data, the way it should be distributed is one dimension, so-called one dimensional block distribution, which means that just divide, let's say rows of a data frame uh, into blocks and each processor owns a block of data. It's much simpler than some of the scientific kind of physical simulation that, applications that may be three-dimensional kind of arrays and four-dimensional and so on and so forth. So uh, we know we have all of that information in the program and we know, you know, for MapReduce, the main thing we need to decide is these big collections or big data structures that need to be distributed and these small temporary ones that need to be replicated across processors. This is one of the key decisions that the compiler makes. Once we make those decisions, uh, uh, the compiler generates efficient uh, uh, kind of MPI binary, which is single program, multiple data, SPMD, which means that you know, each processor owns a chunk of the data uh, and there is no kind of master executor approach here. So that's uh, uh, how, how to think about it. And the implementation is, the algorithm is a data flow compiler algorithm, kind of like liveness analysis, origin definition, all these standard compiler algorithms. So all the theoretical goodness applies here. So for all these operations that the compiler has, um, uh, there are transfer functions that, uh, that apply and uh, is, is kind of applying con constraints on parallelization of the uh, arrays and operators. And the whole uh, algorithm is a fixed point iteration that converges to an optimal solution. 
to your point, Andy, if you want to handle control flow and things like loops and things like that, you have to have a data flow compiler algorithm that, that is able to do that. Um, so uh, in terms of the kind of theoretical setup of the algorithm, if you want to do data flow, uh, uh, you have to have a set of properties you want to infer. In this case, as I mentioned, 1D block distribution, you know, basically is this data frame distributed or not. Um, a 2D block, if you have multi-dimensional, two-dimensional arrays you want to see, which is used rarely, and replicated, uh, which is uh, this data structure should be replicated. Replicated one is the bottom of the lattice. The 1D block is the top of the lattice because we start from the top. We want to make everything distributed as much as possible, but some constraints make some things replicated. So uh, that's um, how it's set up. And we have uh, D of A is distribution of arrays and D of P distribution of parallel for loops, which I'll show in a, in a minute how they, they look like. So we have this kind of setup and we have transfer functions for these IR nodes. And uh, you know, each iteration of this whole algorithm is applying this a big transfer function on distributions of arrays and computation, get a new, new version and continue. So it's like this fixed point iteration algorithm, just like other data flow algorithms. And um, uh, for, for fixed point iteration to converge, you have to make sure your transfer functions are uh, monotone, which, which is very critical. Otherwise you will <laughs> hit into inf infinite loops. So uh, you can change distribution to replicated, but you can't go from replicated to distributed. It's very important to keep in mind in the implementation of this uh, to make sure it converges. But it converges very quickly converges to optimal strategy for a strategy that a parallel programmer would do. Um, very strong guarantees compared to the approximate integer programming algorithms of the past. A few examples of transfer functions, uh, just, just to see how they look like. If you have an assignment, the left-hand side and right-hand side should have the same distribution. So it's the meat of the two uh, distributions meaning that if any of them is replicated, they are both replicated. So you apply this constraint. So that's one example. If you have binary operators of arrays, which we translate into power forwards most of the time, but sometimes we don't, um, all, the, all the arrays involved output and the two arguments have to have the same distribution. So it's meet of the three things applied uh, to all three. If you have join of tables, um, all the columns of a table should have the same distribution semantically. Doesn't make sense to have one column replicated, the other column distributed. So it's a meet of the different columns. Um, and if you have these function calls or internal operators that are not some IR node, uh, we have a table for them and you pass in the distribution of all the functions, uh, all the arguments and get the distribution of all the other arguments out. And if there's something unknown, um, some, uh, some unknown API call, all the arguments are replicated because we don't know. You have to be conservative in a compiler. So that's kind of the theoretical setup, but practically here's one example. Um, we have a data frame, DF has three columns on the left. And um, uh, we, you know, it's read, read from parquet file, for example. So the rows can be distributed across processors, you know, 1D block distribution, uh, the, the technical term. Uh, but if you do df.mean, which is give me the mean of, you know, every column, the output in pandas is a series object with three values. A series object is like an array, could be distributed, but semantically, it's very clear that it's like a reduction. It's a small scalar-like thing and has to be replicated across processors. So this is an example of uh, something that uh, the, the algorithm infers automatically. These solutions that say, change your pandas import into something else, and just uh, that's it. <laughs> um, they usually, you know, a lot of uh, complicated applications, the programmer doesn't know to manually make things replicate across, across processors. And uh, we have seen they uh, hit some wrong results because of these issues, but Bodo can take care of these. Um, and in terms of uh, some of the kind of machine learning algorithms, if you have the sample matrix and your labels, obviously these arrays 
the way they interact, they can stay distributed. Uh, in this case, we have three processors and we divide the data across them. But the weights of the machine learning algorithm, let's say logistic regression has to be replicated because it's like on the reduction side. And it's very interesting that you write NumPy code for these algorithms and uh, all these semantics fit and you know the algorithm, uh, the compiler finds the, the, the distributions automatically. With human eye, it's not as easy to figure out, but the semantics of the APIs are very clear. Um, so that's about kind of a data distribution, but uh, a lot of the compute um, is in terms of um, data parallel operators, not join and those sort of things. Um, so for do those kind of things, let's say this uh, array, um, element-wise array operation here, A uh, times uh, B plus C, we tra uh, transform them into parallel for loops, these par fours uh, that we can parallelize and uh, fuse the loops together for cache efficiency because in regular Python or other scripting language, the back end of this operation, these operations usually C, so it's fast. But uh, what makes it slow is that you do A times B, store to some temporary array and go load that array again for the next operation because these are library calls and cache efficiency is very low. But here with uh, par for fusion, we gain a lot of cache efficiency in a lot of cases, 10x speed up. But so, so that's in terms of sequential optimization, but these par fours are very uh, good for uh, uh, distribution as well, distributed computing as well, which uh, in this slide I have it, uh, I'm not gonna go through that, all the details of uh, how we distribute compute and par fours, but basically the idea is that uh, we see what array accesses the par four has and um, how the array is accessed, the index of the access the in the first dimension, that's what matters. We do a uh, distribution on the first dimension and meet the, all the arrays and all and this par four together, they, they have to have the same distribution. And we know that we generated these par four so there is no cross uh, iteration dependency. So we are not analyzing Fortran code, which makes it much, much simpler to do. And if there are some cases that we don't understand, we can be conservative and assign replicated and throw a warning for, to the user, which happens very rarely. Uh, so in terms of results of this, um, here is um, uh, one of the uh, use cases, a real application in a kind of large retailer that we did. Uh, so the original setting was one of the known cloud services running Spark uh, on Azure but it was uh, taking more than an hour for a single data pipeline to run on a large cluster. Um, in this case, uh, 16, 16 nodes and 432 cores. Um, so uh, they couldn't run it in real time if someone needed some analytics, so they had to pre-compute. And even then, you know, these clusters are not cheap, uh, costing them a lot of money <laughs> per month. Uh, so with Bodo, the same application, came, uh, uh, was faster, 12, 12 times faster, meaning just a few minutes to run so they could run it in real time and save over 90% of their cloud bill, which, uh, which is very significant in their, in their case. So just kind of a real workload with this approach that actually works, but um, there are a lot of benchmarks and you can do a lot of analysis on it of how kind of the Bodo HPC approach compares to things like Spark this example is from our biggest customer, which is a large tech company, <laughs> uh, uh, Fortune 10. Uh, and uh, um, their IT is very much into comparing benchmarks and things like that. So uh, they uh, created some cluster on AWS, 125 nodes, 4,500 cores. The, AWS would never give me that much resources and quota, <laughs> but they give that company, of course, a big company anything they want. Um, so they created this large cluster and took this TPCX Big Bench um, benchmark. Uh, Big Bench is the subset of TPC, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, apparently more useful for uh, machine learning. It's still a little too simple for machine learning applications we have seen, but that's the best we got. Um, and uh, they, they compared their optimized, tuned, uh, whatever Spark setup with Bodo without any tuning and over 20X speed up at that scale. 
uh, which is uh, very significant, both in terms of performance and, and cost. Um, so why is Bodo and kind of HPC approach so much faster than Spark? I touched on this in terms of the distributed systems approach versus parallel computing approach. So in the distributed system approach, the Python code is written in terms of these high-level APIs, um, and they run on this uh, 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 driver library. Um, the program is on a single pro driver process, but it's uh, the driver is interpreting the code essentially, and when it hits data parallel API, creates tasks, go across cluster, come back. We call this waves of tiny tasks. Um, and these tasks have a lot of overhead because the program is not really parallel. But with the Bodo approach, uh, the program is compiled to a native binary that runs on bare metal, and there is no concept of driver. Uh, all the uh, processes own their own chunk of the data, single program, multiple data approach, and uh, they run efficiently uh, and do their collective communication if necessary uh, until they finish the computation. There are no task overheads, no driver bottleneck, and we think that this is the right way to do parallel computing. That is made possible with Bodo because if you don't have a compiler uh, to parallelize end-to-end, -end, you would have to go uh, through the li library approach. Um, other than uh, performance, uh, these MapReduce libraries have a lot of limitations in terms of the kind of thing they can do because the tasks are, are um, asynchronous, idempotent, whatever, so they can't communicate directly. And you can't do things like Moving averages, moving averages, for example, very common operation uh, requires near neighbor exchange, but you can't do that in a MapReduce library like Spark. Or you can't do cumulative sum, which is uh, uh, the prefix scan operation, um, difficult to parallelize, has a lot of communication, doesn't fit MapReduce. The way you know MPI scan um, is already available, but the classic algorithm for it is um, you create a tree of partial sums of the values, even though you know the algorithm cumulative sum looks sequential, but you can do it in parallel in a good way, which is you know create a tree of partial sums, go up the tree, and then come down the tree, distribute the partial sums on the left, and uh, you will have the um, prefix sum uh, of the values in the output. So uh, something like Spark can't do this. This is a complicated communication pattern, doesn't map uh, match map reduce very well. Uh, so what are the limitations of uh, uh, Bodo? You, you mentioned, Andy, um, you know, this seems uh, uh, very difficult to do. Python in general creates a lot of challenges because um, any kind of compiler needs data types. Without data types, you can't do anything in a compiler. Um, and in Python, uh, you, you can do things that would eliminate any possibility of uh, type inference. You know, I have a couple of examples. You know, in some, some variable on the left, variable A could be a scalar or an array, and uh, the user could do a type check and do some work based on dynamic type of the, the value. So that's a possibility in Python. You can't assign a type to, to A, and uh, it's a crazy type of thing uh, for a compiler. You can even change the function that you're calling in Python. A function call is just a callab so-called callable object and you know, in the middle example, F, you can change it dynamically. Um, but something that's more kind of a, a closer to the data processing side, you can even change the schema of the uh, data frame. Your table schema through control flow can change, uh, which creates problems because schema is part of the data type. So all of these problems exist. However, in practice, these are very rare for analytics applications that we have seen. And if there is a corner case where this happens, just the compiler needs to throw the right error and the programmer can do some things in standard Python, then pass it to the JIT, JIT context or refactor it to avoid these, these issues. Uh, so we think this is doable for, for almost all programmers to do. And the, our job is to throw the right error to guide them uh, in the right direction to take advantage of Bodo. Um, another kind of practical um, aspect of implementing a system like this is uh, compilation time, because you're creating all this new compiler technology and we write it in Python. 
So anytime we create a new compiler technology, initially compilation time is uh, not great. You know, the same thing was true, I'm told, for C++ templates and uh, a lot of other things. So uh, a lot of our effort goes to uh, bringing down the compilation time and getting rid of compiler inefficiencies. So with that, just want to show you a little bit of uh, how Bodo works. Uh, we don't have too much time, but um, here's a notebook I'm running on my own laptop. And uh, my quote unquote cluster is my own cores. Uh, I'm attaching to four cores on my own laptop. And uh, I generated some small data set, just one column of daytime values in a parquet file. And the regular Python is loading the parquet file and uh, using dataframe.apply to do some custom transformation, unlike UDFs of SQL. Um, and uh, it creates typical ETL operation, creates two new columns. So uh, I'm not gonna run this, it takes five minutes. And, and uh, by, by the way, this data structure, uh, this data frame has 10 million data elements. With Bodo uh, on a single core, these sort of things um, are compiled to binary and are orders of magnitude faster than standard Python. Uh, and here, you know, it took about one second out uh, from down from 300 seconds. So uh, you gain the sequential optimization benefits, especially for these user-defined functions. But then you can, you know, I I'm adding this PX operator, uh, Jupyter syntax, as uh, attaching to my uh, uh, cluster, little cluster, and I get speed up, you know, 0.2425 seconds uh, because of running on four cores. Um, and the same way you can run on, uh, you know, 4,000 cores. We just had the same setup I showed you at this big company, and uh, you can watch some of our demos online. Um, all right. Um, so we are building a platform based on this idea that uh, the idea is open source APIs of Python are uh, are supported, but the platform takes care of connectors, automatic parallelization, optimization. You can run it on-prem or in the cloud. We have a SaaS service and can load, uh, work with any kind of storage. It's storage agnostic, uh, which feel free to look at our website for more details. So now, now SQL, why SQL? <laughs> uh, so initially when we built this initial prototype, we went to this uh, big tech company and said, hey, we can solve your machine learning problems. They said, great, look at, take this code. And it was kind of data transformation in SQL and Python. <laughs> um, and uh, they were running uh, using these high performance GPU uh, SQL engines, and uh, they were not happy with the complexity of the code and performance. So we showed them with regular Pandas code, we could run that code uh, over 10 times faster um, and much easier to manage the infrastructure, much more scalable with regular CPUs they could beat the complicated GPU setup. So uh, that's how kind of we got started. And we learned that data processing is the problem, not the fancy machine learning algorithms uh, that have all the hype. So even for this kind of big tech company. So we did that, but uh, a lot of the groups told us we have all the SQL code and uh, what can you do about those? We use, you know, Spark SQL or some other SQL engine and it's slow, not easy to manage. You guys seem to be doing very well in Python. Can you do SQL? So we don't have to rewrite our SQL code in Python. Um, so uh, we thought SQL is a solved problem. <laughs> there are so many solutions out there, distributed the SQL engines, it should be fast and easy, but it was not true. So <laughs> uh, we built Bodo SQL on top of Bodo, which I will uh, explain in a little, in a little bit. And, uh, uh, we, we are getting very encouraging results. Right now it's in beta, but there are, uh, it's already used in, in, in a few deployments, which is, which is interesting. Uh, so in general, the problem today is that uh, data applications are either in Python, Python is the dominant uh, language for data science and machine learning and AI, but data processing is mostly done in SQL. And uh, the application becomes a, a mix of these two. Um, uh, and developers are a mix of these two as well. Some prefer SQL, some 
some prefer Python, makes it very difficult to develop and deploy these applications, do error checking across the two languages, scale the two together, and there are skill set mismatches. Uh, you know, you have to use SQL for some things, Python for others, it's not uh, an easy choice. So we came up with Bodo SQL uh, to solve this two language problem. Just uh, example code to make, make it more clear. This function is, uh, you know, kind of a JIT function uh, that uses Bodo, Bodo SQL. The data is read in Python in data frames, and it could be terabytes of data. And the data frames are passed to SQL to a SQL context, and this uh, uh, bc.sql call just runs a SQL query. And the output is just data frames. So it's a uh, frictionless uh, data frame in, data frame out, and uh, uh, you can do both SQL and Python together, scaled together. So all of those two language problems go away. And also you, you get error checking end to end. So if I, uh, so this uh, SS customer SK column in this slide, I changed it to SI, just a typo in the last group by. And in regular Python SQL setups, uh, you have to run the SQL code, which could be something very long. And then you realize you have an error in your program and it could happen in production. But here in compile time, uh, Bodo catches the error and uh, throws the right error for you. Uh, which, Before but, you had the, you, you you could tell, but like you had, you you just add the the decorator and you don't have to change any of your Python code. Modulo like you know some some funky just corner cases. But now this looks yes. like you're now bringing in something Bodo says for Python for the for, for the SQL con context. Yes. Right. Like so, what was yes. is like what was the code like before? Was it like SciCog the Postgres or Snowflake? Like like is it? What you're showing here is that exactly how it was written before, or this is a, like a new thing that you're providing? Um, this is close to how uh, these things are written. Typically, okay. there is some Spark SQL context or some other SQL context that's been created, Snowflake or, I don't know, Teradata or whatnot. So we try to create APIs that look similar, uh, very similar to those, but still fit the Bodo compilation model. Uh, for example, we very much like the uh, context ob uh, object to be immutable. So we can do our optimizations and it's like the data type is clear. So mm -hmm. some of those things uh, we try to do, but uh, we, want, we want to make sure it's familiar, but fits, fits our compiler model. I was, what I'm saying is like, sorry, uh, like that you, you can't automatically uh, you convert the, the Snowflake Python code to your code. Um, what is Snowflake Python code? Yes, we can. Um, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, the connect, the, you know, the connection object, it's basically the same thing you have, and you know what I mean? Like it's, instead of saying Bodo, it would say Snowflake or whatever. Yes, you, we could do that. Um, but, uh, you can't think of Bodo SQL as equivalent to Spark SQL. We want to make sure you can load Parquet files. Uh, and uh, from S3, and we are kind of storage agnostic. Okay. Uh, so it's like a single layer that can do other things. The snowflake or those kind of objects are uh, attached to the particular storage, so they are not uh, as uh, uh, as storage agnostic and portable. Okay. But we That's could it. do that too. Okay. All right, so the way it works today is this function uh, the SQL portion go through CalSite and we get an optimized logical plan. Uh, we translate the logical plan to Python code that Bodo understands. And, you know, we started with regular Python code that just we compile recursively, but we are going towards more internal representation of the compiler to make it faster and more flexible. But the rest of the Python code comes into the Bodo compiler. So these two are compiled together and a binary goes out. And that's why you get optimization across them. In this case, uh, you know, the parquet files may have, you know, typically in practice 30, 40 columns, but uh, this program uses four or five of them. So it's, it's important to uh, optimize out the rest and not load all the data. So that's the kind of optimization that you can do in this setup. That wasn't possible. 
Um, in terms of performance, this is uh, Bodo SQL is in beta early stages, but it's quite promising. This is one of the TPCH queries um, and we compared with uh, Spark SQL and regular Bodo. Uh, it's not as fast as Bodo yet. There are a little bit of, uh, there is a little bit of inefficiency in the code that we generate, but uh, we hope uh, we can close the gap soon and get the same kind of performance that Bodo provides. Um, and, but still we are much faster than something like Spark, um, even for this uh, simple query. Um, all right, a little bit about some of the optimizations we do in Bodo, some of the interesting things, um, both Bodo and applicable to both Bodo and Bodo SQL. Uh, one is, you know, obviously we have a lot of compiler optimizations and compiler techniques used. The program on the left loads um, a data frame from a parquet data set and changes one of the column names and returns two of the columns. Um, the problem here is the column name changes in place. So uh, the, the data type changes, your table schema changes. Uh, so we, you need, uh, we have this iterative typing uh, algorithm that kind of is able to fix these issues uh, in common cases and continue typing. Um, that's a, a key piece of it, which, you know, needs its own talk. Uh, it's interesting transformations to make typing possible in these cases. But also uh, something that's very critical is getting rid of these data frame wrappers and objects to be able to do more optimizations. So uh, when we read, read this uh, data frame um, object, uh, we kind of, if the columns are used in some operator, we break it up and just use the columns that are necessary, the arrays that are necessary uh, so that uh, we can get rid of the data frame object and the other columns uh, in the compiler pipeline. In this example on the right, it's kind of like the IR that's being generated, read part K, but only columns A and B that are actually used later. And then in output, create a data frame with those arrays. So we only read two arrays, get rid of all the other junk in the IR. Um, and uh, optimize out the unnecessary columns. Um, some of the transformations that in SQL is easy or SQL-like things like Spark is easy because it's just a, a, an expression tree. Um, uh, they, they, they are harder in, in Bodo because it's a Python program, uh, but still doable. For example, filter pushdown uh, we do a pattern matching if there is read part K and there's some filtering right after and the data frame object read from part K is dead, we have to do that check. Um, then we can do filter push down and uh, it's a transformation. Um, it, it has a, a bunch of elements to it. For example, if you use this some computation to get the filter value, in this case, PD to, to date time of S, um, is used is part of the filter. So we have to move it above the read parquet uh, uh, node. So um, it, it's kind of uh, some of those uh, issues of Python have to be solved by the, by the compiler. It's more complicated than the SQL setup. Um, there are other kind of uh, parallel computing uh, optimizations that can be done. Um, one example is doing per efficient parallel join, very classic problem. Um, and the main bottleneck is shuffling data. Even with MPI and RDMA kind of fast networking, shuffle is still the bottleneck for, um, uh, for joining, joining tables. So we use Bloom filters to reduce the shuffle data uh, uh, before shuffling a table. So basically, for, from one side of the join, you create a global bloom filter and you filter the other table. You know, you create a bloom filter from the smaller table and you filter the other table uh, before shuffling the data, which saves a lot of uh, communication. Uh, but we found out that uh, implementing this, this in practice, obviously there's a trade-off of uh, uh, the communication cost you save versus the cost of creating this global Bloom filter. So the implementation efficiency is very critical. Otherwise, just doesn't make sense. First of all, you have your Bloom filter implementation should be 
efficient cache friendly when you search the keys it has to be in the same in one cache line and not uh, uh, cause cache misses and it has to be simd implementation and so on and so forth uh, to be fast but also creating the global bloom filter is a reduction all reduce operation and you have to have very good topology aware reduction communication algorithm for it to make sense uh, otherwise the cost is just too high uh, this communication savings are not worth it so we have a lot of heuristics uh, to to know when to uh, use bloom filters and how to set the parameters what is what should the size be stuff like that you know a key parameters is uh, uh, the, a key data point is table cardinality um, how many unique uh, keys you have and we use hyper log log to estimate that globally again that also needs very efficient parallel communication otherwise it doesn't make sense so we are gaining a lot out of uh, efficient MPI communication for for our optimizations and a lot of our assumptions are based on that so once you do that some um, some other techniques don't really make sense we found out that you know for avoiding shuffle a key technique is broadcast a smaller table so that you don't need to shuffle um, but we found that with good uh, bloom filter uh, communication uh, Broadcast join is rarely faster. A broadcast join in general is a non-scalable algorithm because if you look at the parallel work and memory, it increases with the uh, number of processors you have, <laughs> which is not normal for parallel algorithms. So W of P, the parallel work, uh, increases with the number of processors and the table size, uh, which is not good. It has to be constant. Um, and memory, uh, memory of M of P increases with the number of processors as well. You know, these today a server, you know, uh, uh, node has 50 cores. So you're du du duplicating your table on each server 50 times. And you imagine a thousand cores or 10,000 cores. Uh, it's crazy. It's so unusual that in parallel computing literature, the subscript P is usually dropped because it's no parallel algorithm does that. So we don't think this is good. <laughs> Loom filters are scalable and nice. Um, the other kind of algorithm that uh, was uh, very dependent on, uh, dependent on efficient communication is a parallel sort. Um, so for parallel sorting, basically you take some samples and create some global partitions. Uh, you know, processor one takes keys from 10 to 20, for example, and redistribute the data and, and then sort locally. And the trade-off is that the more samples you have, the more balanced your partitions are, uh, but it takes more time to do the sampling. So sample work versus uh, sort work at the end. Uh, and you want the, to strike the right balance. So theoretically, um, the maximum load, uh, this epsilon is uh, you know, one plus epsilon times the average load. You know, let's say 10% more than average, some processor may have uh, some data, 10% more data. So if you want to achieve 10% uh, maximum uh, uh, load difference, uh, theoretically you have, there's this formula, which is uh, the total sample should be P times log of N total number of elements you have over uh, epsilon squared. Um, so, you know, this is the theory in practice. Uh, we found that if we optimize the whole process of uh, sampling and uh, all to all kind of uh, uh, shuffle of the data, this formula actually works, <laughs> which was very encouraging, uh, but it, it's very critical to have uh, efficient gather of these samples, broadcast of the sorted samples and all to all for shuffling the data. Otherwise, this, uh, these formulas don't work. And you know, on the same kind of tech company setup I mentioned, their IT really likes Teradata a benchmark for uh, big data systems. And on 4,500 cores, they took uh, a four terabyte data set and sorted it. Photo was eight times faster than their optimized Spark, even though this doesn't have any optimization for Bodo to do, except that parallel sort and uh, things like that should be implemented efficiently. 
Um, so a lot of these things I wanted to bring, bring out the fact that a lot of these operations depend on efficient shuffle. Um, and, and we use MPI uh, for this efficient okay. shuffle. Ishan, so uh, we're short on time, and I think somebody in the audience has a question. Can but, I have, can I ask a question, Andy? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm Ishwar here. So, uh, Ishan, this is a good, good uh, insight. I was, I'm a pure Spark guy. I've been playing with this huge data. I have, this is a big eye opener, but I have a few questions. How do you manage the resource management? You know, you showed me the TPC benchmark. The thing is that you still need those many nodes to do this operation, but you can do it in lesser time. Do we still mm -hmm. need those many nodes or can we have a smaller node and optimize it? Well, uh, Bodo is scalable. You can run it well. If it will work efficiently on a single core all uh -huh. the way to 10,000. It doesn't need to be large number of nodes. I'm just trying to show that it's scalable on large number of nodes, but a lot of the, you know, we have a community edition on four cores and you can take the, take advantage of the benefits even on four cores. So you don't have to use a lot, a lot of nodes. In terms of resource management, it's orthogonal to the parallel computing problem. It's a scheduling problem. There are schedulers from, you know, Slurm to Yarn to others you can use to manage your resources as jobs come, come to the system. Uh, and we think we shouldn't bundle those things with both. Or Spark has a bundle of a bunch of things that actually hurt performance, we believe. Okay. So Kubernetes and things like that. Okay, and one last thing. So in Spark, we see GC pass and something. So here in Bodo, there is nothing like that. In Spark, what do you have? Sorry, I missed the, it. The garbage uh, stuff, you know, oh. GC. The oh, garbage, garbage collection. Oh, there is no JVM issue here. <laughs> because you're using the LLVM stuff, so there is nothing yes. to worry about it. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so um, just I'll finish quickly. I don't know, uh, I'm I think already over time, so I'll uh, skip the resiliency section and uh, uh, we have a blog post online coming online soon. Uh, we'll discuss that later. Uh, so basically on this slide, shuffle doesn't fit ma the MapReduce model. So the Spark way of creating files and spilling and things like that is just a hack but MPI does it in memory and just direct messages. So it's much faster um, and uh, all data processing is depending on this. So with that, I would like to conclude. Um, we are um, very excited about what we have achieved here. One second, what, what happened to this? And uh, if students here are looking for a deep tech kind of startup opportunity, we have offices in Pittsburgh too. <laughs> so please take a look. And in general, the compiler approach is very promising if you are looking for research topics for your PhD. And uh, uh, the parallel computing approach is much better than the suite of systems uh, uh, for a lot of these problems. And uh, efficient communication with things like MPI is so critical. A lot of your optimization assumptions uh, may not be valid if you are not using efficient communication. So with that, Thank you guys. <laughs> Sorry for running right. over. That's okay. So I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have time for one or two questions. I know there's a, there's a bunch of people uh, that have questions on the chat. Uh, so Doug, do you want to go first? Hi, uh, I'm Doug Baylog. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Pittsburgh. I work for Valor Equity Partners. Um, so I was just wondering how, how Bodo handles uh, like losing a node, a spot instance in the middle of a long computation, like, you know, Spark. Spark has an RDD, which, uh, you know, takes care of that. Just wondering how, how Bodo handles it. That was actually <laughs> my resiliency portion. Um, so basically in Spark, yes, there is RDD, but uh, when for any real application, uh, uh, there is communication across processors and Spark goes back to uh, some checkpoint. So the model of Spark is you can't change the parallel algorithm and you have to use checkpoint restart in Spark as well. In Bodo, you can uh, use uh, checkpoint restart as well. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the restart, the middleware uh, is something else like so Kubernetes is doing the restart um, and things like that. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is in practice, because Bodo is not JVM and this uh, shuffle files and all these issues of Spark, there is no software failure. 
so you cannot you you cannot you you need to only worry about hardware failures, which are much rare, much more rare in practice. Like a node fails every ten years or something. If you have spot instances and your workload takes that long, then you have to checkpoint. Uh, uh, that's correct. I, I was just thinking of the case where you're using spot instances and you can lose one, you know, at, at any time. But but typically, aren't they supposed to be up for sometimes weeks? Not spot instances, but they'll take you down any time. They won't. Yeah, I, I know, but practically there is. Uh, anyways, but but typically, yeah. if you want to not lose computation. You have to checkpoint. Otherwise, you have to have just a restart setup. But something to keep in mind is that if you are, uh, you know, twenty times faster than Spark, uh, even if you, even if magically Spark is able to restart, which it, it cannot, but even if magically it doesn't lose any computation, you can run this twenty times, <laughs> and you're you're the same as Spark.